Hi, I'm Noel Kingsbury, and with my colleague Annie Guilfoyle, we run Garden Masterclass, which we started five years ago to do educational workshops for garden and landscape people in the British Isles. Hello, and I'm Annie Guilfoyle. We still do uh, live events, in-person events all over the British Isles and also into Europe, in fact. But since COVID happened globally, uh, we now have a, a, an online programme and we do webinars as well. So we are now a global garden community. All our information packed webinars are recorded and they're available from our website. They're pay to view, but members get a discount. And this is a recording of our weekly public service broadcast that we like to call our Thursday Garden Chat. It goes out at six o'clock on a Thursday live and that's six o'clock UK time. We talk to people from all over the world, designers, gardeners, horticulturalists, nursery people, botanists. Um, and so it's always a great range of people um, and always very exciting. Uh, we've got recordings here on YouTube, but masses more on our website, and our members will have access to even more. In fact, we've got hundreds of hours on our online library. And take a look at our website um, and see what's coming up on our diary pages. Everything is listed in the diary, so webinars, live events, um, everything that we do, it's all in a chronological order, and you can click through to a link to yeah, get in more information or to buy tickets. And you may want to sign up for a monthly uh, newsletter, our, our mailing list, or you might like to become a member. We do these weekly events for free, as indeed do our speakers, but we have costs, which is why we really appreciate donations. And you can make donations from our homepage. Well, we really hope that you enjoy this recording and please come back and try and So it's, uh, it, it's great to have Jane Perone with us this evening, who has just done a book on houseplants. Uh, it's a, a really fabulous book. Uh, I really mean that. It's full of stories and history and trivia and quirky stuff and wonderful background information about some of the familiar or indeed some of the, in some cases, less familiar uh, plants we, ha we have as, as, as indoor plants. Um, you know, personally, I've always had a, a real love of indoor plants, which I know is not something that's shared by all, all, all gardeners, uh, which is something we, we'll touch on. Um, first of all, Jane, uh, we always like to start with asking you, what's your, your personal garden history? I mean, how did you get into growing? Uh, I'm one of those people who just had it in my blood from a very young age and just wanted to do stuff with plants, mainly house plants, but also um, messing about on my dad's allotment and in our garden. Uh, and I remember I have some very, very young memories of licking London pride flowers next to our pond and planting parsley seeds under the kitchen window and coming back half an hour later to see what had happened. And obviously nothing had happened because I was, <laughs> but I was five. So I thought there would be some instant uh, developments. So, um, yeah, I, it's just been something that's been a lifelong interest of mine. And I've been lucky enough. Uh, I mean, as a child, I never thought that that plants or horticulture was something that I could do as a career. I always wanted to be a journalist, but I've been lucky um, in the last uh, 16 years to be able to combine uh, my profession of journalism with garden writing. And uh, so that's that's a real delight. Uh, just wish that I could have more time to spend with my houseplants and uh, my rather neglected garden. Right. Um, so uh, you've, your previous book was about allotments, I think, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. my previous book was about allotments and that was published when I was at The Guardian uh, just before I started the job of gardening editor. And yeah. though this is a very different book, really, Legends of the Leaf, going inside and looking at um, our indoor gardens. Mm. So would you like to you know, go into a bit more detail and basically tell us about the book? Yeah, so the book is uh, a passion project. I can honestly say that I've got a lot of houseplant books. I've got uh, four sets of shelves here and probably uh, at least one of them is just houseplant books. So I've owned a lot of houseplant books. I've read a lot of them and I felt there was a kind of a gap that there were not many of those books that really went into any kind of depth about the 
way that plants grow in the wild, how they ended up being coming into cultivation, how they were used by indigenous people in the places where they grow in the wild, and also how they have become part of our culture. And so that was something that I that I felt that was a gap that I wanted to fill. And uh, I had pitched it around to a few publishers and really got not that much enthusiasm. I think it was a point, this is sort of 2019, where there was a bit of a dip in excitement about houseplants before the pandemic, this is. And so, uh, you know, I was kind of told, well, there, are, there aren't any more houseplant books to write. And I disagreed with that. Anyway, so I ended up doing um, going with um, a publisher called Unbound, who is a, a traditional publisher, but they have a crowdfunding model. So that allowed me to uh, appeal to my podcast audience. So I make a podcast called On the Ledge, which I've been making for the past six years. It's about houseplants. So I was able to appeal to my listenership and say, I want to make this book. Can you help me make it happen? So that's how the book came about. And uh, I had a lot of leeway going that route with my publisher because they really did let me um, have a lot of free reign in terms of the content, the title, the cover, etc. that you don't normally get from a publisher. So this, if you don't like it, the only person you can blame is me because it really was my vision um, for the book down to, you know, from the cover to the illustrations um, and the, the choice of plants. So that's kind of how it happened. So there was about eight month period of crowdfunding that I wrote the book. And, you know, sometimes this is a difficult period because not surprisingly, people don't really understand the world of publishing and how long things take. So I did get people saying, oh, you know, you filed the manuscript, so we'll see the book in a couple of weeks, will we? And you're sort of thinking, well, no, it's obviously going to take a lot longer than that. Um, but it's great to have the book out there now. It's published. It's out there in the world. And my people who pledge for the book have uh, it's making its way to them now. Some people in, in uh, other countries haven't quite received theirs yet, but I've had lots of lovely feedback from the people who have. So it's um, that is really uh, delightful because the book was quite intensive to write because I didn't want to write one of those houseplant books you see, see which is just kind of put it in indirect, bright indirect light. You know, I think we've got enough of those kind of books. So I did a lot of research, digging through archives, reading old books, um, and obviously that takes time and um, investment of your of yourself so it's been a wonderful project to work on but i'm very glad that it's out there in the world now <laughs> finally great great well done i mean how did you choose the plants to include so the book includes 25 i call them iconic houseplant species i guess probably there's one or two that somebody would argue with me about but I can I can I can sort of give a cogent argument as to why they're in there. I chose species that would be recognisable, hopefully, to people around the world, even if they weren't that into houseplants. They would think I've seen that plant before in a shop window or in somebody's home. Um, and I chose plants partly also that had interesting stories. So there were a few plants that I looked at that I just thought, well, this isn't going to make enough of an interesting chapter. Um, so I sort of slightly picked cherry picked ones that had interesting backstories um, and ones that, as I say, are ubiquitous, grown around the world, loved. Not all of them have been grown for centuries. In fact, um, the plant that probably is the newest into cultivation is the string of pearls, Curio rolianus, uh, which only was only really came into cultivation really in the, the 50s. And even then it was took a while for it to get going. So, um, yeah, I chose the plants um, for to try to get a range of different kinds of plants also. So there's aroids in there, there's cacti, there's a palm, there's a fern, trying to sort of come across the gamut of different types of houseplants too. Um, and as I say, it's a personal choice. I'm sure people will disagree with my choices and wonder why X or Y isn't in there. But as my son has pointed out to me, well, there's the sequel. And he's actually come up with um, two sequel names for me, uh, Secrets of the Stem and uh, Folklore of the Flowers. I have said to him, I'm not ready to write another book yet. But um, so there may be, you know, you never know, there may be another 25 plants I end up profiling. But uh, it was tremendous fun. And 
those choices are, are, are probably quite personal ones, but I hope there'll be something in there for everybody to appeal to. It's a book you can either read from cover to cover or you can dip into individual chapters. I mean, I, I say a great, a, a great dipping book, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, I think, uh, you know, the publisher sort of said, oh, this is a sort of a, a gifting book. I, I was worried at some point writing it that it was just going to be too uh geeky like it was going to go it was the, the amount of depth that I was going into was going to be of limited interest but I kind of feel like that is something that needed to be done and I, there was loads of stuff that I couldn't fit in those chapters so actually you know mm -hmm. it doesn't go into as much depth as I could have done um and I think for me it reflects the fact that uh often houseplants are not treated with the same kind of uh in-depth coverage as other kinds of plants and that extends to scientific research it extends to horticulture house plants are often dismissed uh and people who grow house plants are often dismissed as oh millennials you know there's quite a sort of can be a bit of a sort of dismissive spirit um around house plants and uh, and yet this may be a controversial view, but I'm going to say it anyway. You you mentioned uh, why some gardeners <clears throat> find that they don't do houseplants. And I would say there's a there's I could make an argument that actually growing plants indoors is one of the hardest branches of horticulture. And that's why some outdoor gardeners can't do it. Because yeah, they yeah, don't and it's, it's, it's always been, there's always been a great puzzle to me. Uh, how many really good gardeners uh, either have you know their their houses are a completely green free zone, yeah. or they they say, oh, I don't do house plants, I can't grow house plants, or or, or, or whatever. Um, so you think actually that that you're almost saying that these people are kind of fair weather gardeners that they're, they're the well, habitat of the house I think, sometimes, I think sometimes people with amazing gardens um have amazing gardens because I mean I'm just thinking back to my when I had an allotment for example you know there's allotments and allotments you can take on a a site with beautiful soil that's that's been beautifully prepared and you'll probably get on quite nicely um for a few years and do really quite well just on the basis of the bare bones of what you're dealing with is good. Um, and the same in a garden, you know, certain gardens um, make your life easy. If you've got good soil, if you've got good aspect. Whereas with indoor plants, really, you are at the mercy of what windows you've got, how much light you've got inside. Light is at least 50% lower inside than it is outside. Um, and you cannot rely on anything else to look after your plants there isn't going to be any rainfall filling in for when you forget to water the plants roots cannot go seeking out other resources they are entirely reliant on you they're like intensive care patients and so it all stands or falls on your level of expertise in choosing those plants and caring for those plants and i think that's what i'm i'm not saying indoor gardeners are better than outdoor gardens i'm just saying that i think oftentimes outdoor gardeners slightly dismiss um what's going on indoors and see it as a, a sort of a kooky branch of horticulture that that doesn't really um contribute much and i would really disagree with that i think it's i think there's much um wonderful horticulture going on indoors and it's a real skill to be able to look mm. after plants mm. properly indoors yeah yeah no I, I agree with you i mean a lot of it does come down to uh, looking at the house as as habitat and actually realizing that in fact houses typically do not offer many many good ha habitats for for, for plants um i mean you yourself what um what are the plants that you you particularly get on with in your home habitat well um i have a lot of succulents um so i have always enjoyed growing cacti and succulents from a young age they were one of the very first plants i had so i have quite a lot of um succulents I love the jungle cacti, so things like Ripsalis, um, Lepismium, and um, some of the Euphorbias. Uh, and I also love the Gisneriad family. So that incorporates um, 
kind of usual suspects like, uh, well, they're not called St. Paulius anymore, but the African Violets and also Cape Primrose's Streptocarpus and the more probably less common, but in my opinion, most delightful of all, the Escanathus and Primulina um, genera, which I absolutely love. And um, they're also some of the easiest houseplants as well. Um, I don't, I do have some aroids, but I don't, I'm not a huge aroid enthusiast um, as many indoor uh, gardeners are. Uh, and I always say to people, you know, pick things that you like. Don't feel like you have to be driven by other trends going on online. If you like big, blousy gloxinias, go for it, because that's something that will make your heart skip and uh, you'll be more likely to take good care of them if it's something that you personally feel excited about. Uh, I think one of the interesting divisions between outdoor and indoor gardening as well is variegation. There's a whole generation of indoor gardeners who love variegation and want crazy levels of variegation in their plants, which to many outdoor gardeners would be a no-no. So there's another division. Um, and uh, but yeah, I I I have an eclectic mix of house plants, but a lot of my collection are succulents and gesnerias with a few other things thrown in there as well. Mm -hmm. No, I think Gesneriads are you know, an amazing family. And in the States, isn't there, there's the American Gesneriad Society. That's right. Gesneriad, yeah. They have that kind of cuddly quality about them. So they're all, they're all hairy. And they seem to do so well with the, the indirect, de, indirect light levels. And, you know, in our last house, we just had really quite, quite a lot. Um, yeah. and, uh, no, they, they, they're, they're really they're, underrated. They're really yes. underrated. I mean, I think there's a there is a, a bit of a trend now moving towards more uh, flowering house plants, which really have been out of fashion for quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, I love flowering house plants and gazneriads often do offer amazing flowers as well as very interesting foliage. Um, they're not that easy to get hold of uh, in any great degree uh, in the UK. But as you say, you can join the American Gesneriad Society and grow them from seed, which is also fascinating. So, yeah, there's Absolutely. a whole lot of Dibley. You've got Dibley's there. Nursery, though, haven't you? In... Dibley's Nursery is probably the exception, yes. Yeah, they, I mean, they, have, they have a fantastic range, to be honest. And Yeah, and but even then, you, there's things you can't get hold of. Mm -hmm. there's other, there are things you could, that, that I haven't, uh, which I have, uh, you know, found, but certainly things like Smithy Anthers, which I also love, um, are quite hard. Well, I don't think I've seen a Smithy Anther on sale for quite a long time in the UK. Um, but, but yes, I just wish more people would grow them and get into mm. them. Um, so that's my my plea. Um, and I also quite like uh, the indoor saxifrages. So uh, saxifrages dolonifera, which is in the book. Uh, and that probably this is the plant that might cause a bit of consternation because it's not that popular an indoor house plant now. But I would argue that it's actually been in cultivation can't remember the exact dates but it's it's a really old house plant it's been in cultivation for a really long time and so I kind of like it for that reason and I do love a house plant that can be either indoors or outdoors so I grow saxifrages dolonifera both in pots in my garden as ground cover uh, but also indoors um, and another member of that family uh, the uh, piggyback plant Tolmea menziesii is another favorite of mine which again um, outdoor indoor plant doesn't like to get too hot but is a, I think it's a really lovely lovely house plant too and kind of curious a curiosity mm, 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 mm. and we got a nice thing come up in the chat from Lois Moss um, house plants are also a wonderful bridge between generations many of the hort groups that I'm a member of bemoan the lack of younger members the interest in indoor plants by young younger than us people can be a gateway to younger people discovering traditional horticulture yeah but I certainly I, I, I said I remember as a young person it was house plants that um grabbed me first and i was thinking of that it perhaps is you know the 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 the, the sill of your bedroom is uh, one of the few spaces you actually have control over you don't necessarily have any control over the garden i mean you may well not have a garden um and so that i i, I suppose it's that's you you are beginning to grow stuff on your own tiny little personal territory. And I think it's interesting over the last, I mean, I really felt that, you know, we did go through a long fallow period where there was really very little interest in houseplants and houseplants tended to be 
linked if a little bit to a kind of 1960s Scandi modernism, you know, Rochford's house plants and all of that. Um, got a bit passe, but we now seem to have a whole new generation of youngsters growing a very different range of plants. I mean, a lot of them succulents, a lot of them things that can be home propagated. And essentially, a lot of them are kind of outside mainstream horticulture. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I mean, I'm <laughs> nearly approaching my half century, but, you know, I have many listeners to my podcast who are 8, 10, 12, 18, Fantastic. 25. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. the vast majority of listeners are in the younger age bracket. Of course, it, it runs the spectrum, but a lot of listeners are... Um, millennials and younger and it's interesting I mean this is part of the reason why I wanted to write the book that uh they don't have the same kind of baggage about plants that say I might have as somebody who was around for at least part of the 70s um so the snake plant for example um they don't uh have those negative connotations of seeing snake plants kind of dusty snake plants in the 70s and 80s they don't have those associations and so they've got a completely different set of references but i did want to um in the book to kind of make a sort of a point about the fact that nothing there's really very little that's new in the world and that includes house plants so lots of these plants have been fashionable before and they'll be fashionable again and the wheel um of house plants will turn uh but it's it, it, it's it very really, really interesting to look back and see how these plants have been used in the past and that can we can we can recreate ideas from the past as well um so with a fresh eye coming to plants but also with a with an eye to what's happened in the past it's it, it, it does it's a valuable thing to look at mm, mm, mm. um christine how are things over in the united states what's the house plant scene like there these days uh, I may not be the right age to be in touch with it. I will just say it's not all that easy to find house plants. Typically, the best selection tends to be at the big box stores. Um, and many of the plants that Jane has in her book can, in fact, be found there. But um, I'm not sure that it has caught on quite as much as it seems to have in the UK at this point. Mm, mm. I'm thinking, you know, this name houseplant may be part of the problem. It just, you know, it, it sounds so frumpy. What if we called it, you know, extreme environment gardening or something? <laughs> yes, yeah, give it a give it a sexier title. Make, yes. make it something that really appeals to the type yes, A yes. personality. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> well, you know, that is happening. Um, if you have a look on social media, there's a huge movement uh of people growing house plants in ikea greenhouses so if you go to ikea and you see those glass cabinets of various sizes and shapes with names like millsbo uh, there are lots of people taking those and adapting them putting grow lights in them putting fans in them growing aroids in them and it's a huge movement there's a huge community on Instagram and on uh, TikTok of people doing that and get, gaining all kinds of very in-depth knowledge about aroids that um, is impressive. And also Hoyas as well. Hoyas are another thing I love to collect, mm. but I'm not a, like compared to some of the people with greenhouse cabinets, I do not have that many Hoyas. Um, it's, it's absolutely, when you start going down that rabbit hole, there are some incredibly uh, impressive collections going on out there and and yeah and doing things with uh huge um terrarium spaces and cabinets and mixing uh water and plants with paludariums and um vivariums for various creatures so yeah there's a lot of really ex interesting um challenging experimental stuff happening in the world of houseplants mm. well you mentioned one thing that experimental that really intrigued me uh, when you were talking about growing house plants from seed, what can we grow from seed and where do we get the seeds? Yeah, so this is something I've been doing on the podcast for the last uh, five years, uh, the On the Ledge Sew Along, and I love growing house plants from seed and I encourage people to do it. It's partly because um, 
I think that is the but like outdoor gardening is the way that you get to really truly know a plant is by growing it from seed. Um, also, it's cheap. And I love things that don't cost me a lot of money. So I can go and buy a packet of cactus seed or I can join the Cactus and Succulent Society and I can buy packets of seed for 50p a throw. And it doesn't always work, but I might end up with some cool plants at the end of it. Um, things that people grow, often cacti and succulents are a popular choice. They're really easy. They don't need pricking out for about a year. So they're not, you know, hugely um, space uh don't take up too much space at first anyway uh people love growing uh monster deliciosa the swiss cheese plant from seed that's one of the few aroid seeds that is available widely uh mimosa pudica the sensitive plant people love growing that from seed uh what else and the range of house plant seeds that's available is growing wider and wider and i do get lots of listeners growing quite unusual things uh so it's it's a really interesting process you're kind of setting yourself up for a degree of failure because it often does go wrong but it's tremendous fun and as i say that's how you really truly get to know uh your plants i mean i've, I've done various episodes over the years so i've covered growing ferns from spores as well so there, there's something for everybody whatever kind of house plants you like there will be some that can be grown from seed obviously not everything because just like garden plants there are some things that need to be sown extremely fresh so for example hoya seed you don't generally tend to see because it has to be sown extremely fresh and you're only likely to get it from another grower if you happen to sort of network yourself in with other Hoya people. But yeah, there's plenty of options out there and uh, it's it's great fun. I, I really enjoy it and I recommend it to everybody. Um, and that way you end up with something that nobody else has got. You know, you end up with a range of uh, plants from one sowing and, and you can pick the best and give the rest away, which is great. Mm, mm, mm um what about orchids i remember you know back to my teenage years you know orchids were not something you really would have as a house plant and then we had the phalaenopsis revolution which is partly about uh you know taking a plant who, who, whose conditions of life are remarkably similar to the temperatures and humidity levels that we humans appreciate and sort of further refining that and of course a whole series of 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 of, of production methods which you know this whole international network of how these things are are propagated and uh, grown on and, and, and sold and you know phalaenopsis do just keep on and keep on and keep on um uh, but what about what about what about our other orchids yeah i didn't include any orchids in the book um maybe i should have done but i didn't um the phalaenopsis thing is interesting you're right yes even sort of 25 years ago 30 years ago generally orchids were something that were grown i mean the orchid world is massive absolutely massive i mean it's it's huge and it's very specialist and there are lots of people who um are entirely encased in that particular uh part of the hobby and don't venture into other kinds of houseplants but in the last 25 years what's happened is as you say reading and techniques particularly tissue culture have revolutionized what we can get and where we can get it. So, you know, phalaenopsis are just grown in such huge numbers now, and the price has come down so much that they're very, very easy to get hold of. The same applies to something like the tropical pitcher plants, Nepenthes, same story. They used to be something that only was grown by people with you know, really specialist conditions and lots of money because they were very expensive. Now walk into any garden center and you'll see Nepenthes for sale. So, um, it's a really interesting um, development and it has made lots of plants that weren't accessible to regular people like you and me um, available to them and I think also the the internet and social media has meant that now people can see a plant a beautiful orchid or an apenthes they can see it online and they you know when I was a when I were a lad, when I was a child, you know, you saw you saw something on TV or you read it in a book, and you had to send off a stamped addressed envelope for a photocopied sheet to get the, or you had to go to a special show and get your parents beg your parents to go somewhere. Whereas now you can click on something and you can say, I'm going to import half a dozen Hoyas from uh, Southeast Asia, 
and you can you know the, people are doing this stuff which you know i'm often surprised by by that that people will go to those kind of lengths and um don't don't see any kind of uh level of difficulty in doing things that, uh, in the past i would have thought gosh i would never have even thought of importing hoyas from southeast asia um is that not to say that's quite, easy quite not, i wouldn't necessarily recommend it but what i'm saying is, is, that, is that actually legal is it legal uh, yeah. provided that you well that there are hoops you have to go through unfortunately there's a lot of um again it's kind of like an, an inst instant culture of people wanting stuff now 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 and so people don't do their research before they start the process it is doable but you have to go through various processes and oftentimes when people don't go through those processes to um, register themselves with the the, the um, animal and plant agency and so on don't get phytosanitary certificates the plants end up in customs dead so yeah, yeah, it's yeah. one of those things where people are very it does happen but i always sort of feel like i want every plant purchase to be a considered purchase i want people to think really hard before they add any plant to their collection and for that reason i tend to feel that uh an individual as an individual person importing house plants is a bit of a slippery slope and i tend to prefer to to get plants that have been grown that have been imported somewhere down the line by professionals people who do that for a living um who've done all the paperwork who've done all the due diligence and i i can wait i mm -hmm. that's the other thing i always say to people is you know there's been this huge uh burst of interest in particularly aroids and now some and not also hoyas and also cacti and succulents but I say to people, you know, that aroid that, you know, 12 months ago was £2,500 for a two leaf cutting is now £25. So if you can just be a little bit mindful, you're going to save yourself a lot of money and you're going to still end up with the same plant. But there is this collector spirit that oftentimes we find ourselves falling into that can 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 be fruitful but also can be dangerous i think mm, and mm, this is reflected in the fact that in many countries in the world for example on the californian coast and also in southeast asia there are problems with these plants being poached from the wild and uh, and taken um unethically from that that environment to feed this market so we have to be cognizant of that particularly when we're thinking of importing things like orchids and cacti and succulents which come under cites and mm. there are very strict restrictions on that. So, you know, you've got to do your research. You can't just click a few buttons and think, I want that plant, I'm having it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, I think also that's why I love growing stuff from seed because, you know, I can get, if I choose to, some unusual gazneriads or some rare cacti and succulents that I can grow from seed. And that way uh, they'll have been sourced responsibly and I can grow them in my conditions from day one which is another mm -hmm. factor for growing from seed is that from the first day they're alive they're in my conditions whereas when you buy a house plant or indeed any garden plant from um, that comes to you as a mature plant it has this horrible shock because it's suddenly in your house which is going to be less light there's no computer controlled uh uh feeding and watering it's just relying on you <laughs> so there's lots of uh, things that can go wrong and mm. if you grow a plant from seed hopefully you avoid that because it's it's kind of hardened off from the start mm, mm, mm. yeah yeah yes um i just wonder I don't know whether we've got any architects listening or, or perhaps when this goes onto youtube in the next couple of days we may, might get some architects paying attention <laughs> um I remember oh, quite a few years ago, Derry, Derry Watkins, who, who, you, who you might might know of special plants near Bath. Uh, I first knew Derry when she was um, kind of not in the house she is now. But she was just a few few miles away. Um, and uh, she and her husband, Peter, who's a Peter Clegg, a very inspired architect. They were looking for somewhere for, for ages to buy, which had to be the kind of perfect, you know, architect, husband, 
gardener, n- n- nursery person, wife combination, and they got an old barn. And uh, Derry specified that Peter had to design a window specifically for the streptocarpus. And so <laughs> this kind of layers of streptocarpus up this wonderful window where they're getting the you know the good indirect light they they they, they need. I mean, what could what could architects be doing to make houses more plant friendly? Well, the main thing is big windows. I mean, that's the the thing. Oftentimes people get very hung up on, oh, you know, I've got um, a south-facing room. But really, if you've got a south-facing room with tiny windows, it's not as much help as if you've got a south-facing room with huge windows. And so many houseplants, you know, oftentimes people say that the main problem with people killing houseplants is waterlogging. It's... (laughs) It is, but that's usually down to light problems, not necessarily and well and substrate. It's a, it's like um it's like a sort of a, a a puppet where all the different parts are connected by strings, and you know you can't just fix one thing and then expect the puppet to move right. You need to have all these factors together. But r- the light is the big thing. So I'm lucky enough to have um uh, a north facing room that has a glass roof, so it's very very bright, but it's not uh so much direct sun so that's a really good space but really the just the size of windows is uh very very important if you've got a huge you know floor to ceiling north facing window it's probably better than a tiny south facing porthole for example so um that's that's really the main thing um and window sills i mean i don't have in my house i mean out my office here and i do actually have window ledges out here but in my house i don't have any window ledges i live in a 30 semi uh i think i've got one window ledge in my front bay window that's it there are no other window ledges which is not great so i think that's the other thing i would say is as you say a good window setup and you know the victorians were doing this very well before uh you know they had amazing uh specially built windows you could see a few of them still around london which were designed mm-hmm. to be filled with plants um but i think the modern home now is oftentimes not designed with plants in mind <laughs> whatsoever um mm. and so we, we but then again we're ingenious and therefore that's why things like the ikea greenhouse cabinets come about and that's why led lighting is used and the other thing to say about that in terms of uh, the history of house plants and influence is of course a lot of that technology that we're the house plant people are now employing those led lights and in to some extent to a large extent the fertilizers being used indoors have all come from cannabis growers so mm-hmm. that's something that isn't really talked about very much but a lot of that indoor growing technology has come direct from people raising uh cannabis plants indoors and interesting, now very interesting it, point very interesting point now it's been legalized in 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 parts of the US obviously I have listeners who are raising these plants but you know LED light technology would probably not have come along for the sake of houseplant growers but there's money obviously in cannabis and so there was investment in that light technology Mm -hmm. so I think that's part that's something that's often not not talked about but it, it is an important um factor and if you go into any of these hydroponics shops again hydroponics it's it's all about cannabis and those shops will also have all the fertilizers and things yeah, which were developed yeah. for cannabis but are now widely used by houseplant yes. growers mm, mm, mm. and i dare say some of the houseplant growers have come to houseplants perhaps through, through growing cannabis. Yeah. yeah indeed absolutely yeah. there are people mm. in that camp who will have started off with yes. a very particular goal in mind and then they have got sidetracked into other things <laughs> yeah yeah yes yeah yeah yes well i, I, I we haven't done a garden masterclass on cannabis culture. <laughs> perhaps we should, perhaps we, should do, we should do that. Get a get a whole new market. Um, so now, Christine, you you had a question struck me as rather a clever one about about measuring light. Yes, Jane, what you said about the reams of books that tell you that you need bright or medium or filtered or all these other words and leave the new gardener in mystery made me wonder if there are any apps for my phone that I can use to measure the light and actually get an idea what kind of light my house has. Have you used anything like that? 
Yeah, there, there are some apps. Um, there is a really good Canadian houseplant grower called Daryl Cheng, who is at Houseplant Journal on Instagram. And he is an engineer by training and he has recently designed a gadget, which is a light sensor and also has humidity and temperature. And there, there are some apps you can use. Um, I've not used any of them, so I couldn't tell you. I do have a light meter. Um, which I sometimes use. Obviously, our eyes are not very good at detecting light because they're, they're also able to react and adapt to low light conditions. The, I mean, you don't have to buy any expensive gadgets really to, to understand light, though, because uh, the, the bottom line is you're probably not giving your houseplants enough light. The danger when I say that is people then say, oh, well, what happened then was I, I moved my plant, my neglected fiddle leaf fig from the darkest corner to, to right by the window. And now it's looking terrible. Jane, what have you done? And of course, you know, if you stuck me in a dark room for six months and then took me onto a beach in the Caribbean, of course, I would be um, <laughs> burnt. A mess. So <laughs> any changes you make to light need to be gradual. If you can't read a book in a, an area of your house, with um during the day then it's way too dark for house plants and so you know really you need to be thinking about that when you're thinking about light coming in you can observe light moving around the room generally morning light is less intense than afternoon light so uh you know plants can tolerate more sunlight than we think they can but it's got to be gradually that exposure has to be gradually built up because plants they get used to the level of light they're in. And the reason why houseplants are houseplants, why those species have been chosen, is because they are incredibly adaptable. So, you know, the snake plant here, Sansevieria, or it's, I mean, I called it Sansevieria in the book. It's now been moved into the genus Dracaena, which I kind of object to. But anyway, the snake plant, you know, it's often described as a low light plant. It's really not a low light plant. It's an African succulent that that um yes it may grow in conditions where there's some level of um cover from vegetation so it may not be totally in uh full light but the, as i've already said the levels of light in your ho home are probably 50 percent less than they are outside and probably even less than they are where that plant grows in africa and therefore really areas need to be in sunny conditions and that's how they grow best yes they will survive a dark corner provided you don't give them too much water but they're not going to grow they're just going to sit there and, and then you have the dusty snake plant scenario we've already talked about and one other interesting thing about that plant uh that i mentioned in the book is i discovered talking to a german nurseryman that that plant in germany is described as um Oh, I'm going to get this right now. The SED plant. Basically, it was it was a plant that was always in political party offices in Eastern Germany, communist Eastern Germany. So they it was kind of that plant. That everyone was a bit like, oh, you know, it had a real connotation. The Stasi, the Stasi plant. How funny. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like you didn't want to see that plant, uh, which is it. I had no idea about that. So that was really, really interesting. And I love snake plants. I think they're amazing. But. Uh, they are one of those plants that are often very badly grown because people take the low light plant advice a bit literally. There are very few plants that will grow in, uh, you know, dark corners of your home. So, yeah, most will benefit from more light. Mm. <laughs> but interesting about your, your little East German observation there, because I always remember as a kid, we often used to go just somewhere in German speaking Europe, and I always remember just really spectacular house plants in these German and Swiss hotels. <laughs> and then, um, in the '93 to '95, my wife was working in Bratislava you know, just after um, after the, the the changes, and I discovered that uh, so much of communist Eastern Europe actually had amazing house plants, and yeah. because there wasn't much of an industry producing them, people really, really looked after them, and you, you would see yeah. these amazing, huge things. Also, of course, a lot of their uh, offices were sort of grossly overheated, but people managed to keep them going. And I think in some ways they probably contributed to a more humid and therefore more healthy um, atmosphere. And I think there's probably a whole, probably a whole book there actually of sort of uh, 
co- communist houseplant mem- 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 memorable. <laughs> some surprising species as well, various things that <laughs> came in through um, Soviet or other communist bloc. Um, yeah. The botanical gardens uh, w- w- would get propagated and the usual black market route of, of, of that part of Europe things would be a garden at the botanic gardens would be propagating and selling a few things on the side and they'd gradually get distributed through yeah. the uh through 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 the, through the city um yes no, absolutely it's, it's and you know there's there's a, even now there's different houseplant cultures around the world I mm. mean Ukraine is mm. really into gazneriads and specifically um African violets and um, streptocarpus are, oh, and gloxinias. Yeah. Yeah. There's loads of people in Ukraine growing those plants. In Russia as well, really mm. big. Mm-hmm. Compared to here, just out of this world. Also, Iran. Iran is really into um, those gazneriads um, and, and African violets particularly. And there's a lot of breeding going on there. Oh, interesting. Really interesting. How interesting. Fascinating. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, yeah. Gosh, gosh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I was thinking about this earlier today. There definitely seems to be a correlation between cold climates and house plants, um, as Eastern Europe, but also, of course, so much of the current wave of interest in house plants, or at least perhaps we shouldn't say it, a pre, the previous <laughs> wave of interest in house plants was very much Scandinavian driven. I mean, the, the the Swedes in particular were rethinking houses, rethinking furniture. Uh, you know, IKEA, of course, is the sort of end product of, of all of that. Um, but I remember, yeah, I mean, I've seen houses in Sweden that actually have small planting beds built into that house, into the floor ne- next to a window. So it's such an obvious thing to do in order to get, you know, really nice things growing up the stairs. And I remember, actually, I think probably on my last trip to Sweden when I was doing some teaching at uh, Alnop University in my uh, the, the the spare room of the lady was putting me up and amongst the reading matter was a book on the history of the houseplant in Finland and I thought Mike was put an utterly obscure topic and I was very glad it was in Swedish so I could understand about 10 percent of it not percent <laughs> of it which it had it would have been in, been in Finnish but you know simply looking through at the pictures I mean there's a really long history in those countries of you know, going back right to the beginning of the 20th century uh, of of growing, of growing house plants to help people obviously psychologically through those those long dark dark winters and the other factor we have to take it into account here is also the way that the arrival of central heating across the world at different points in history massively changed the way we gardened indoors so in victorian times the reasons why people were growing stuff in cabinets and growing stuff like kentia palms and aspidistras was because of the pollute heavily heavily polluted air um that so many houseplants couldn't survive so that was why they were put behind glass and why the kentia palm and the aspidistra thrive because they could cope with those levels of ethylene that other plants couldn't cope with ivy was also absolutely massive in victorian times Mm, it was mm. cheap you could go and get some strip some off a tree you i mean people had incredible ivy displays plus ivy did well because homes were not centrally heated they were cold and so ivy usually doesn't do very well i sort of just sometimes discourage people from growing heterohelixes and, and suggest they grow something like swedish ivy because um ivy doesn't generally do well with central heating but the victorians loved it and used it very widely so you know it really did revolutionize what we grew indoors and it's interesting now that we've got a bit of a fuel crisis going on here i think we might in the uk we might be reassessing some of those um some of those choices uh but yeah things that would not have been that would have been considered stove plants in the 19th century so plants that grew in heated glass houses uh, would be things like alocasias um philodendrons other members of the aroid family which just would not have survived the polluted air and the cold air and the drafts of victorian homes that started to come into homes in the 20 20th century uh, because the conditions were changing uh, and becoming more amenable to those kind of plants being indoors so that's another major factor and if you look at house plant books even from say the 50s so there's a really good book by uh, an um, uh, anglo-american garden writer called thalassa crusoe called making things grow 
And that's really on the cusp of central heating coming in. I think it was kind of in America, the time she was writing was becoming commonplace, but not so much in the UK. And she talks about, about that and about the plants that can thrive in her um, American apartment uh, that probably wouldn't survive in a, in a British mm. home. So yeah, they're, they're, it, and that's the rise of the Phalaenopsis because the Phalaenopsis is the perfect plant for a steady 20 degrees centigrade, fairly dry air uh, home, which is centrally heated. So mm. that's had a huge impact as well. Okay, um, any more quick questions, Christine? Anything from your end? Well, I do have to ask, Jane, since you were talking about this trend for LED lighting and kind of enclosed gardening, besides propagating plants, are there, I usually grow my house plants one to a pot, and I'd be really curious if you have any recommendations on combinations so I could grow kind of a container arrangement instead of these single specimens in a row, which are actually kind of boring. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a danger that many houseplant growers fall into of having the sort of the muddle of pots, you know, and it's a lot of work to water individual pots. I do have a sort of a, a lot of my plants are use something called wick watering to try to save time, um, but it's still time consuming. And combining plants is a really good way to cut down on that. So in the last year, I've got a lot of snake plants, different species. And in the last year, I've been combining those together in containers to reduce the amount of care they need. And that works really well. Uh, I think we're often misled because if you get one of those kind of, uh, unfortunately, they're often the result of funerals, but they're one of those houseplant gift baskets. I was going to mention that. Sometimes the plants that are combined together there are extremely unfortunate. You know, it'll be a phalaenopsis orchid and a fern and a cactus. And you're thinking, gosh, why? But you, as long as you choose plants that have got similar care needs, um, I mean, you can't go too far wrong with having a group of uh, succulents. I mean, there are differences, but generally speaking, succulents together will do well. Um, birds together will do well. There are different combinations you can try. And even if you don't have go to the lengths of taking individual plants out of their pots and potting them together, putting their root balls together, one thing I like to do, particularly with plants that like to remain moist, but like to be well drained, uh, so things like begonias, this is a real game changer if you're a begonia enthusiast. You can take, have them in individual pots, quite freely draining substrate, but get a big salad bowl or a big, some kind of big bowl and stick a load of gravel or expanded clay pebbles at the bottom. Stick some uh, nylon wicks in the bottom of the, into the bottom of each nursery pot and then water from the top, excess water goes into that sump at the bottom and the plants can take up what they need they create their own microclimate it saves an awful lot of work and it works really well for things like begonias um also sacks of rages it works really well for ferns um so it's definitely worth experimenting with those um you can also do some sort of with bigger plants you can do some almost ground cover indoors. So one of the plants, in fact, I'm doing an episode of my podcast about this tomorrow. Uh, one of the plants I like to use as ground cover is a little oxalis called Oxalis Demolis um, Aurea Reticulata, <laughs> catchy name, uh, which is the gold veined oxalis. And it's a very small oxalis, shamrock like leaves, it grows from little tiny bulbils. And you can just chuck a few of those in the top of a pot when you're planting and you get them covering the bare soil. So I have these in the top of like trailing hoyas and things, and they'll often go dormant in the summer, but they'll come back from the bulbils and you're just finding a way of covering the bare soil. So there are lots of experimental things you could do. And I would encourage people to experiment. It doesn't always work. Things go wrong. But the good thing with houseplants is it's not like you've, I don't know, you've planted out a 20 metre long bed with full of a certain type of tulip and it's going to be a real effort to get rid of them all. You know, with houseplants, that's the delight of it is that it's even endlessly malleable. So if something goes wrong, well, hey, you know, just change the pot. It's not as hard as outdoor gardening in terms of um, turning the ship around when things go wrong. <laughs> 
Now, what about the expanded clay balls? I admit <laughs> I have never used them and they seem like a brilliant idea. How how can, can you use that in the begonia example that you gave? Yeah, so uh, laker or expanded clay pebbles are widely available. I've got them above me right now on my green roof as part of the substrate. So they are basically like, it's kind of like clay popcorn. So it's been popped at a very high temperature to create this very lightweight, porous uh, material, which is ideal for lots of things because it's not only holding on to uh, moisture, but it's also holding on to air, which, you know, lots of people get go wrong with houseplants because they forget that roots need air as well as water so expanded clay pebbles have endless uses you can put them on the top of a pot to cover bare soil and stop splashing of soil when you're watering you can put them as i said at the bottom of a tray of begonias and they'll just soak up that water because of their size they they come in different sizes but usually they're sort of pea-sized or bigger and because of that size, you can endlessly wash them and reuse them. Um, so that makes them very, very handy and also quite sustainable. They, I mean, their production is not the most sustainable thing. But once you've got a bag of this stuff, I've, I've just bought a second bag. The first bag I had has probably lasted me eight years because I keep reusing the stuff. So you can use it for that. You can add it to substrates. So oftentimes if you buy houseplant substrate, in a bag, it's often too heavy for a lot of houseplants. You can just add some drainage material and laker is one option, just adds a bit more air, airiness to the mix. Uh, what else can I use it for? People use it um, for hydroponic and semi-hydroponic systems. So you just grow in the laker. Um, that is something, I'm a soil person. I haven't gone down that route, but that's very, very popular with um, younger houseplant gardeners. Uh, what else? That's probably the main ways you could use it. It's very, very handy. Or you could even, the other thing you could do with it is you could kind of use it as almost like a packing material. So if you've got a really nice big pot that you want to use, uh, a cash pot, and you've got a much smaller nursery pot with a plant in it, you could just pack around the outside with the laker and water into it and unless you're really over enthusiastic with the watering it shouldn't cause a problem of the plant getting waterlogged because the laker just absorbs the excess water um, so it's a, it's a really useful stuff i think it's uh, becoming more widely available in the, the us now it's it's fairly widely available and especially if you go to one of these grow shops they'll definitely have it <laughs> Great, good bit of advice to end on. And we should have the details of uh, how people can listen to your podcast. Yeah, uh, so uh, my website is janeperone.com. And uh, sorry, yeah. well, I just blow my nose again. <laughs> the sun's blinding me. Um, the Yeah, so janeperone.com is my website. And on there, you can find out all the details of the book, my podcast, you can listen from there. It's also on any app that you, yeah. any podcast app you might think of. And uh, yeah, there's loads of resources there for people who are interested in learning more about houseplants. And uh, there's a more than 250 episodes of the podcast. So yeah, Fantastic. there's loads Gosh, of material there. Pick yeah. a plant and there's an episode on it, including Clivia's actually. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, recover quickly from your cold and thank you very much for your time, <laughs> Jane. That was fascinating. And uh, yeah, great. Really thank you very much. Bye. Bye.